Hello and welcome to this, the 99th episode of the Royal Society of Medicine's COVID-19 webinar series. My name's Tim Ringrose. I'm current president of the Digital Health Section at the Royal Society of Medicine. And as you can see from my background, I'm currently in Orlando, Florida for the Health Information and Management Systems Society conference. Uh, and the fact that I'm here from the US uh, is a good indication that this is a truly international event, one of the things that online events is, is so good for. I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. And we're here to discuss a topic that is a great threat to health. It spreads faster than any pathogenic virus, causes significant harm, and is responsible for many deaths around the world, sadly. What am I talking about? Well, we're talking about online misinformation and its sinister cousin, disinformation, and specifically the impact that these have on our response to controlling the COVID pandemic. The World Health Organization describes this as, a, as an infodemic. And Tedros, the Director General, has stated that finding solutions to the infodemic is as vital for saving lives from COVID-19 as public health measures like mask wearing and hand hygiene and access to vaccines, treatments and, and diagnostics. And a recent publication in uh, JAMA from analysis by Stanford showed that as many as 12 million people in the US have foregone the COVID-19 vaccine as a direct result of misinformation. So there's no doubt this is a very serious phenomenon. So today we're going to explore the impact of misinformation and disinformation and consider what we can learn and how best to respond to this infodemic, whether it's for COVID-19 or other health issues. And with me today to discuss this very important topic are Professor Susan Mickey, Director of the UCL Centre for Behaviour Change. Susan is clinical and health uh, sorry, clinical and health psychologist by training and has participated in SAGE and the SPI-B subgroup advising the government on COVID-19. Su Susan's taken part in previous episodes of the RSM's COVID uh, series, uh, so we're very delighted, Susan, to have you back again with us today. Hi. Well, thanks. And joining us is Simon, Dr. Simon Piontek. Simon is the Digital Analytics Lead at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Simon describes himself as a digital practitioner and social media researcher and leads the Vaccine Confidence Project at the school. He's uh, no doubt an expert on the subject of misinformation and I'm delighted that he joins us today also to discuss this important topic. And to everyone thank listening, thank you. And to everyone listening today, um, please do uh, add your questions to the Q&A. Uh, we've already had lots of very interesting questions submitted in advance. Uh, please do submit questions uh, during this webinar and we'll do our best to address as many as possible. Uh, and if someone else has asked a question that you think is interesting, what you can do is uh, click on it to vote it up and we'll, we'll pay most attention to those. So let's kick off. Susan, first of all, could you just um, quickly explain what's the difference between misinformation and disinformation? Well, misinformation is where people just haven't got the correct information. Um, they lack the educational, they lack the opportunity to get the correct information. And they're the most straightforward group because um, giving them the correct information as often as not really helps. Disinformation is where the, the problem really lies. Um, this is intentionally spreading false information around. And this might be in the form of conspiracy theories, which are quite elaborated groups of beliefs um, that are um, not very rooted in reality, um, but also um, intentions to uh, create policy un uncertainty by spreading fake news and, and other lies. And it's really important to really distinguish between those because the approach one takes is obviously very different according to um, what's going on. Thank, thank you. So disinformation is really the very sinister, uh, whereas misinformation is, 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 is sort of potentially less of, of a concern. Yes, and um, disinformation is sort of three main groups of, of people. Um, one are sort of political ideologues, whereby, you know, the spread of disinformation suits their uh, agenda. Um, the second are people who are anti-science, and that's a, a, another uh, large group. And then, sadly, actually, there are also scientists themselves who've been known to um, spread uh, information that's not correct. Thank you, and perhaps we'll come, come back to that in, in a few minutes. So turning to Simon, um, let's explore some of the evidence about the impact of misinformation and, and disinformation on, on vaccine uptake. Simon, you've published some of your research in this area. 
Uh, we're all aware about the vast volumes of misinformation that exist around COVID, particularly online, but what's the evidence that this has actually had an impact on people's willingness or intent to be vaccinated? Thank you, Tim. Um, I, I, think, I think the study that we um, published um, early last year in 2021 um, is a good example of how to actually quantify the impact of misinformation on people's willingness uh, to get vaccinated. I believe this is one of the first studies of this type ever conducted. And um, just if, before I go into our findings and, and present some, some facts and figures, uh, it's um, just, just one point um, to note that uh, the study was conducted just before the vaccines became available, uh, both in the UK, uh, in, the, in the US, because these are the countries that we focused on. And uh, also, uh, by no means, we, we're not saying that misinformation is the only factor that's contributing to vaccine hesitance in this study. But, so these are the two important things to uh, note when you listen to our um, findings. Um, the, the actual design of the study uh, was very, very simple. We identified uh, five examples of misinformation in the US and in the UK. These were um, examples that were shared on uh, social media. So that includes um, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and other social media platforms, but also examples of misinformation that were shared in, um, generally speaking, the digital media. So these could be coming from websites as well. And the in terms of the methodology, we, we asked people about their willingness to get vaccinated. These are two representative samples, both in the US and in the UK. We had control and treatment group. And um, the control group saw the correct information about vaccination programs and the uh, treatment group, we exposed them to those examples of misinformation. And immediately after exposing them, we asked them the same question again about their willingness uh, to get vaccinated. And the results we got in both countries are actually quite similar. There's, there's, there's around 6% drop in willingness to vaccinate. So this shows the potential impact of misinformation immediately in that very moment. Again, we're not saying that is the only factor. There will be other uh, new sources people will be listening to. They will be talking to their friends, to their colleagues. There are other factors as well. But nevertheless, it shows that 6% is a significant uh, percentage of people that um, um, might not get vaccinated because of the content they saw uh, online. And with that study, we also went a little bit deeper. We tried to see uh, who potentially might be more susceptible uh, to misinformation. If we can see if there are any particular groups of people um, that um, could be more susceptible than, than other groups. And without going into details here, obviously we, we saw some interesting stats in both countries. So for example, people who are unemployed are less likely to be susceptible than those who are employed or uh, women are a little bit more susceptible. Uh, we also saw some differences in terms of, um, uh, in terms of people's religious beliefs. Um, but overall, actually building on this work, we continued throughout uh, 2021, trying to establish the groups of people uh, that might be more susceptible. And just trying to summarize it in, 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 in really, uh, in, in, in nutshell, what we're seeing is basically more based on uh, people's beliefs rather than uh, the description of uh, who they are in terms of um, where, where they sit in terms of income or gender. So basically it is an issue of trust. And uh, generally speaking, very broadly speaking, it is people who do not have trust in science. It is people who do not have trust in government. And it is people who do not have trust in the media or the mainstream media. These three groups are most susceptible and um, they will act upon it. So if for those of you who are joining from the UK, just imagine the situation when we had a government official or the prime minister of the UK um, promoting vaccination programs with the chief scientific advisor standing next to him and that was um, on the BBC. And if you have no trust in um, either in the, in the media or the government or the science, uh, this is a perfect storm example. Like if, and, and those people, they were prepared to actually act upon that and, and, and promote their views to very strongly anti-vax, just purely based on that lack of trust.
Thank you, Simon. And did I hear you correctly that unemployed people tend to be less susceptible to misinformation? Any, any ideas why that would be the case? So th this will be very different in, in different countries. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, try to overanalyze it. It's potentially um, based on the fact that they might be getting their information from different sources um, and they might be kind of um, less prone to analyze uh, the information that they're hearing with their peers at work. They might be less exposed to larger groups of people to, uh, to talk about this. Um, but um, I wouldn't say this applies um, globally. This will be very, very different in, in different countries. The fact that we observed some tiny differences in the UK and the US doesn't mean that it applies uh, globally at all. Yeah, but a 6% drop overall is, is, is hugely significant, isn't it? It, it, is, it is really significant, especially in those countries, uh, especially if you think of building uh, herd immunity uh, obviously, things have changed uh, massively now in the US and in the UK. We now do have data um, and we can see who actually got vaccinated, who did not uh, choose to get the vaccines. For example, here in the UK, uh, we're seeing that certain communities, um, uh, minority communities, for example, the Polish community or the black community in the UK or, um, um, or people living in, in, in large cities or um, uh, younger people, um, they are more hesitant. It doesn't say that they're um, more susceptible to misinformation, but we, we're seeing kind of more detailed information based on the, the, the real data who actually got the vaccine. But uh, at least that is what we were seeing back in uh, 2020 when we conducted the study just before the launch of the vaccination programs. Great. Thank, thank you. Uh, well, very interesting, Simon. And, and um, if we turn now to what can be done to respond to this, so, Susan, as a as a behavioural psychologist, what are your recommendations from all your experience about the most effective ways to, ta to, to tactics to counter misinformation? Yeah, well, again, I would really repeat that hesitancy is a very different thing than, than disinformation. So hesitancy, um, the main reasons people uh, don't take up vaccines are they're worried about side effects, they're long, worried about long-term safety, and they um, potentially don't think it's effective. So those are the three key things. Um, there are, um, as Simon said, as among certain groups, there are other things come into the equation. Um, yes, uh, black communities in the UK um, have experienced their own discrimination, but also there's historical discrimination, uh, including from, uh, sadly, the, the medical as well as uh, political community and other communities. So um, one has to have the starting point as to why people aren't taking yeah. up. Uh, the vaccination. Now, in terms of um, misinformation, or sorry, disinformation, um, I think that really the priority is not so much um, trying to, to uh, target those people and devote one's energies there, um, but to ensure there's not a vacuum. I think one of the problems this time around is that um, nobody acted quick enough and vacuums were allowed to emerge and they were filled with all sorts of things that then set up priors for people, you know, establish frameworks within which people thought about things. So I think one of the real lessons for less for next time is, is act quickly and get um, narr you know, science-based narratives out. Um, as Simon said, trust is absolutely key here. Um, trusted sources. Uh, we know from the data, politicians are um, one of the least trusted groups in society. Obviously, it depends on different countries. Certainly, that's true in the, in the UK at the moment. Um, health professionals, um, medics and um, scientists are all more, more trusted. But also, different communities have different people they trust. It may be faith leaders. It may be uh, well-known sportsmen, sportswomen. It may be champions in one's own community. So identifying who the trusted people are, the trusted sources are. Then just really important um, to actually confront um, disinformation and um, give alternative narratives in a very clear way um, with specifics. Um, and I think ensure that there are trusted websites as well as trusted people, but associate those trusted websites with the trusted people, because when you get on the internet, it's a jungle out there. So 
you know, one does need to go to people one trusts to then say, these are the websites where you'll get um, good information. Now, those websites need to be accessible. They need to be attractive uh, for people to engage with. And the other thing that evidence shows is um, effective is actually calling out the kind of tactics that are used um, with disinformation um, and, and, you know, absolutely show uh, how those are um, doing damage, the kind of tricks they use, um, and also the associations of some of the people giving out uh, disinformation. There's a, an article coming out in the BMJ shortly. I think Yang is the first author, uh, which is a very interesting empirical study of uh, looking at the sort of media and uh, political contacts, contacts of some of the well-known um, disinformation groups in the, in the UK that I think is well worth looking at. Right, so it sounds like two very important things to consider and, and not allowing a vaccine as uh, a vacuum to develop. So we need to be very on much on the front foot um, providing information. And, and, and as you say, at times we have been a bit slow. Uh, and also that possibly one of the most harmful things is for a scientist to be propagating false information. Um, are there any particular yeah. pieces of, uh, of information that you think have had the biggest harm over the last two years? I, I don't have the information on that, I'm afraid. Um, no, I, I, I really couldn't say that. I think what we do know is there's very little research in this area. You know, there's, there's plenty of research on the general principles that I've been uh, talking about. Um, but a lot of that's been in, in labs or slightly artificial kind of field studies. So what we really need, I mean, now we know quite what a problem this is. What we really need is research located in context, because as Simon said, countries are very different and communities within countries are very different. Mm. And sadly, I mean, one of the um, committees I'm involved with is a, a WA World Health Organization um, a behavioral uh, science and insights group. And you know, what we've we found out there is that um, very sadly, a lot of the disinformation and conspiracy theories that have emanated in the United States and the UK have had really damaging effects in lower and mid med lower and middle income countries. Um, and that's obviously you know desperate given all the other issues mm. that are going on. So I think we do have a real responsibility uh, for funding good research in this area. Absolutely, yeah. And are there any tactics that are counterproductive that actually make the problem worse? You know, might be delivered in the best intention, but actually have the opposite effect. Well, I think I think the main problem is is um, ignoring it, is is just letting it go. Um, I think if one's dealing, I mean, obviously online is a bit different than than uh, offline, but um, if one's dealing with people where there's quite a strong identity. Um, One's, one's really got to, to recognize that and work with that and not put people into corners um, because that can be very counterproductive. So, you know, the best way is to find out, is there anything there that you can agree with in terms of what's being said? And that's your starting point. Start from what you can agree with and then build up bit by bit, bringing in, you know, facts, science-based evidence, et cetera, logical argument, um, but in a way that is minimally directly confronting, because then what happens is people get defensive, they turn off, they stop listening. So it's that using quite subtle ways of engaging people, taking people with you. I mean, it's, it's part of the broader uh, area of, of, of persuasion and, and influence um, rather than directly confront and um, yeah, put people into corners where they can't get out of. And I think also in that context, um, bringing new information to people. So people may have got fixed ideas um, that are difficult to lodge. So if instead of trying to dismantle those fixed ideas, you're able to say, we now have a new information, you know, we are in a new situation or we have some more scientific advance that I can share with you. And we are in a changing situation. So there usually are new aspects of the situation. So if one can do that, you know, then again, one can open doors and bring people with one um, that's going to like, like to be more successful than just trying to directly confront. Thank you. So I, I'm sure we've all been multiple times in situations where we've been one to one with someone who uh, has views that we, we, we don't think are, are accurate. So your advice is to not confront them, but to try and find some area of commonality and agreement and then build from there and try and introduce 
new information rather than challenge existing information that they've, they've already seen. Yes, exactly. Um, but especially for people who are, who are misinformed or have been taken in by disinformation campaigns. If we're talking about you know, hardened disinformation groups, of which sadly there are a few in this country, uh, then with them, it's really important uh, mm -hmm. to directly confront and say, no, this is wrong. And, and then bring in um, you know, evidence and perspectives and quotes, et cetera, from people who you, you know or, or think are trusted by the groups he's trying to talk to. Yeah, yeah, very, very good practical advice, thanks. Um, so, so turning back to, to Simon, um, you've been involved in the Vaccine Confidence Project Initiative with UNICEF, I believe, uh, and that's, that's a project to seek to equip local governments across 16 countries with tools to respond to online misinformation. Can you give us a, a, an overview of that project and the advice you gave and the, the principles that you used? Yes, well, essentially what we were trying to do is uh, what Susan has just described, but we tried to do this um, in practice. And we, we faced exactly the challenges that Susan has just described. Uh, we, we've learned very quickly that countries are very different and it's not just the uh, language that is different. They've got people have got very different cultural backgrounds and um, you need to talk to them differently uh, and deliver different messages and obviously have different, um, very different messengers. But the, the key things that we've learned, and I'll, I'll go into details um, about the actual project and what we did uh, more specifically, is that um, the, we can only change people's minds through conversation. The, wherever we went, and we covered 16 countries, um, starting from the Eastern and uh, Southern Europe, uh, from the Balkans, um, going east, uh, Turkey, Georgia, and ending as far east as um, Kazakhstan, we saw that it needs to happen um, during the conversation. So the top-down um, model of communication, where you have the government official or scientists posting a message on social media or uh, on their website or you know, NHS website doesn't really work because it's not conversation. It's the one way sort of top down model of communication and this doesn't work. It needs to happen through the conversation. And then if you have a conversation, you need to have trusted partners in this conversation. So again, referring back to what Susan said, um, some messages cannot simply be delivered by politicians or scientists. They need to be delivered uh, the local faith leaders, um, community leaders, they need to be delivered even by local celebrities or sports personalities. We saw that in several countries um, in Eastern Europe or, uh, or uh, Central Asia. And the role of messenger is really, really important. It's not just about the message, it's the messenger um, as well. And um, the final point I wanted to make before I go into kind of more details of what we did is that we also learned um, in, in 2021, when we were working on this project, that misinformation travels freely between countries. There's no borders. And it gets translated, obviously, into um, different languages. Uh, a lot of it sadly starts um, in the US and in the UK and then travels abroad. And then by the time, let's say, it gets to France, it gets translated into French language, then it's very easy for this type of information then to travel to Francophonic Africa. We saw that as well. And the translation doesn't happen just on the level of the language, but also on the level of the culture. So they kind of contextualize it. Um, so it's more relevant um, to the people um, in, 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 in the local um, community or in that particular country. But what we did um, in all those countries, we initially started with um, setting up um, social listening tools uh, for them. We worked with UNICEF, uh, we worked with uh, local um, governments. Uh, um, vast majority of those countries, these were health ministries and teams created, especially for this purpose, or there were in some countries there were existing teams. And we created those social listening tools just to learn about the digital landscape, just to see what's happening around this particular issue. Some of them were well equipped, they already had that set up for the routine immunization programs in the past. But let's be honest, before COVID, these were just niche conversations, whereas COVID brought it to the mainstream. So we had to teach them how to use social listening, how to use it to understand what's happening in the digital landscape. So we actually not just gave them tools, but we also trained them how to use these tools. In the second stage, 
we actually learned about narratives, the mis and disinformation narratives that we could identify in those countries. And again, I'm gonna go back to what Susan said. Um, these are very, very different. Although some of them are reoccurring in all the countries or very regional, but they travel between boundaries. There's no limits there. And um, they are quite different in different countries. So you can't have a single approach for every single country. It needs to be tailor-made for the country, both on the level of the message, but also um, the messenger. So once we've done that, uh, we finally, this is the final stage we are currently working on, uh, we help to develop a campaign. We help to identify those messengers and the actual campaign and messages that we believe should work. We're currently testing that with them. The idea of the project is to actually give them tools and give them knowledge so that once we've left the project, once it's finished, they know what they're doing on their own and they're able to actually uh, combat misinformation if it occurs uh, in the future. Fantastic. It sounds like, as in any good conversation, the first thing to do is, is to listen. Uh, very important point and, and understand the local context and environment. Well, Absolutely. Well, social listening is all about listening to start with. Yeah, yeah. Well, wish you the best with that project. And, and turning back to, to Susan, as you mentioned before, you've been involved in the WHO Technical Advisory Group on Behavioural Insights and the Sciences for Health. And I think it, that, that report outlined three uh, strategies to increase vaccine up, up, uptake. Could, could you explain what those are? Yeah, sure. And actually, they, they reflect um, a, I suppose, the simplest but most comprehensive model of behaviour that there is, which is called COMBI. And the C and the O and the M stand for capability, which is knowledge and skills and physical um, capability. Um, the O is opportunity. M is motivation. For any behaviour to occur, all of those things need to be in place. So if we look at vaccination uptake, um, in terms of capability, uh, knowledge is a starting point. You know, we need to ensure that people have the knowledge. And that doesn't mean just giving information to people. You know, one has to um, really understand the levels of their um, scientific understanding, their literacy, so being very, very culturally sensitive. So once knowledge is in place, uh, the next two concern the opportunity, enabling environments. Um, you know, we know in the UK, uh, say with health professionals, where there was, you know, surprisingly low levels, um, people weren't getting uh, sometimes um, time off to be able to, to go and get vaccinated. We know in other jobs, people weren't getting paid time off. People were worried that if they got vaccinated um, and had to take time off, they wouldn't have sick pay. Um, also, we got evidence when, you know, kind of mobile units went around offering vaccination in areas where it's really easy for people to get vaccinated, that increased. So ensuring that environments are really supportive and enabling of people to be able to have vaccination. Then the other side is the social opportunity. Uh, so the social influences on people that are really important. Um, you know, we're very, very influenced, obviously, by the people around us. And I think that's also one of the things when we were trying to shift people away from anti-vaccine thinking to pro-vaccine thinking, thinking about how do you explain that to your peer group when sometimes people are part of peer groups with very sort of strong shared identities and types of thinking. And then finally, the M is uh, motivation. So ensuring that people are motivated um, using a lot of the um, kind of strategies, I suppose we've been discussing um, already, but those things are all interconnected. Um, but understanding them for any particular co community is actually key to developing the types of interventions that are likely to be most effective. Too often people just go in with interventions, any interventions to change behavior, uh, thinking, well, this sounds like common sense. This sounds like a good idea to me. But, you know, we would never expect doctors to behave like that. We'd expect them to do a really good you know, examination, formulation, diagnosis before deciding what kind of intervention is likely to be most effective. Same with, same with this. And in fact, the, the combi model is, is the core of a, a much bigger uh, framework of behavior change interventions called the behavior change wheel. And so depending on your diagnosis of the behavior of that particular community in their situation, the extent to which it's you know, knowledge, enabling environments, social influences, motivation, would point you into the direction of particular types of intervention strategies and types of policy to underpin them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I, as I think you've said before, we've also got to give people the opportunity to act on it quite quickly before they change their minds again, I suppose. Yeah, yeah that's key. Yeah. 
Well, thank you, Will. It's, it's now time to turn to some of the questions that we've had. We've had lots of questions, so thank you to everybody for sending those in. Um, let's start with one from Benjamin Wright, who asks, um, to what extent does evidence say that those spreading disinformation actually believe what they're saying? Do I, any of you, either of you have any insight into... I know of no evidence on that, and I'm not quite sure how one would gather the evidence about it. <laughs> it's a tricky thing to do. What's your gut say? Um, I think there are I think there are very different kinds of people. Um, I think there are people who um, believe nonsense very passionately because it is part of you know a bigger conspiracy theory that they're part of in terms of their peer group. It's reinforced, etc. And and they do you know they do believe that. Um, there are other people, and this BMJ paper that's coming out is, is really good at um, showing what's going on, where um, people are using this instrumentally for certain goals and outcomes. And for those people, sadly, uh, like I think we you know quite a lot of politicians who may say things that we have a very um, good guess that they don't actually believe themselves. Mm. Um, and uh, Linda Pritchett asks, and I think possibly we've hit touch on this, but it'd be interesting to, to hear your comments. Do you think the opportunity of, that the opportunity should have been taken during press conferences to discredit, to discredit conspiracy theories? You know, should, should we have tackled these head on earlier? I personally think that would have been a good idea. Um, I think that it's actually a shame that um, uh, Chris Whitty and Patrick Balance didn't um, do what previous uh, chief scientific uh, advisors have done and, and had their conferences that could speak directly to the public, because I think that would have had uh, more influence. And I think in that kind of circumstance, I think it would have been a really good opportunity um, to actually say, these are some of the things you may hear, and this is why um, there's no basis to them. So one of the other tactics I, I didn't really talk about was inoculation, where you, you, know, you actually um, take it on um, before people have heard about it, before people are influenced by it. So when they then hear it, they're less likely to be influenced by it. And I think, um, and again, um, you know, in relation to what Simon was saying about conversation, I think that could have been done, there could have been other fora where there could have been good conversations between maybe people who had the wrong end of the stick and somebody who's trusted like Chris Whitty. So I think for the future, you know, we're learning as we go along. I think for the future, that's definitely something that should be considered. Mm. Thank you. And, and I guess related to that, um, sometimes uh, things that uh, political leaders say uh, may not be quite the correct message. Uh, and uh, Catherine Mandel asks, how do we counteract subtle disinformation, e.g. by politicians saying things such as Omicron is, is mild and used to justify stopping protections? Um, that, that's, a, that's a thorny issue, isn't it? Simon? I think the, the approach to, to that type of misinformation, I mean, would we define it as a misinformation today? I guess we can sort of try to think of a kind of the entire spectrum. You've got those absolutely crazy ideas, conspiracy theories, and something that is very, very settled. Um, I'm actually going back to, to, your, to your previous question while answering, uh, while trying to answer this question. Um, I, I do think we should uh, use the opportunity of press conferences to, to debunk the, the main conspiracy theories or main um, misinformation um, examples that we are seeing, but not necessarily um, discuss the smaller ones or the ones that are just appearing, because very often by doing that, we are actually giving it oxygen. We are giving these people um, Sort of the energy to talk about it and to discuss it, so we kind of bring in it to to the public. I mean, very often, a lot of these narratives are being sp spread and shared just within certain bubbles of these um, kind of parts of the internet. I'm, I'm just focusing on online at the moment. That um, the, the kind of the majority of the people actually have no access to. So we need to be very careful and very selective uh, what we actually debunking because uh, we don't want to make we, we don't want to give those people error. In terms of um, politicians doing that, I'm, I'm quite concerned that by doing that, we could be politicizing it. So we need to be very, very careful as uh, vaccination programs is something that shouldn't be um, part of the political game. It should be generally understood and confirmed by the main, all the main political 
actors that it is something that is needed and um, full stop. If we're gonna start discussing it from the political perspective, I think it could be, we could be entering that kind of uh, dangerous area where we open up discussion about something that is um, quite obvious um, to everyone. So I would be, again, quite careful about that. Mm. On, on the question of mild, um, it's not just politicians using that word. It's also scientists and health professionals using that word. And it comes back to what I was saying about the importance of being incredibly clear and precise when, when we're talking about things. You know, what does mild mean? You know, we have mild cheese. <laughs> you know, mild is a very generic uh, issue. Um, what we do know is that Omicron is causing less uh, deaths and hospitalizations in the context of vaccination that, than previous viruses did. But let's look at what's happening in Hong Kong now, you know, with, with uh, huge numbers of unvaccinated elderly people. It's anything but mild. So this is exactly the kind of conversation that needs to be had in very simple, straightforward, ordinary language. And, you know, as, as scientists, as uh, educated health professionals, we shouldn't be using that word. You know, we should be talking about actually particular situations and particular effects. Yeah, so we very, need to be very careful to use precise words in, in, in any communication. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And David Nicholl um, uh, makes the point and asks the question, do we need to look at countries like Finland where they teach how to deal with fake news even in, in primary school? Is this, is this something that needs to be part of the school's curriculum? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, many years ago, I was on uh, NICE's Public Health Interventions Advisory Committee, and we looked at um, the sort of inoculation effects amongst school children being taught about advertising about smoking. You know, so again, that's another example that if you can forewarn people about things, if you can explain the mechanisms and the context and what it's trying to achieve, then it's like giving people tools to be more critical evaluators themselves. I think that's the key thing we haven't talked about actually, but it's mm. really important. It's a whole background, education and science and health literacy, um, you know, that um, really needs to be right from school uh, years up throughout lifelong learning. Um, and, and we have a, a government where they're not strong in terms of science. Um, I think that that shows. Um, so I think it's, you know, for all of, of society, having much better public understanding of science. And again, I think that's something that this pandemic has shown very clearly. We've been so lacking in preparedness and resilience in so many ways. And I think this is one of them that, you know, if we can do better, and I haven't come across any um, government led strategies or any other strategies to really turn this around. But if we can improve the scientific understanding all sections of society, um, then people will be able to um, make their own minds up easier and be less likely to get drawn into uh, different kinds of disinformation. I could just add to this, I absolutely agree with Susan. Um, we, we absolutely should be starting very, very early. And um, we also should um, increasingly start using technology to do that. So for example, when we're talking about um, children or uh, teenagers, uh, gamification or using technology to actually teach them about mis and disinformation um, could be a great way forward. Yes, I think there was a game made which was demonstrated to have quite a significant impact on, on people's uh, intention to have the vaccine. Um, so that, and uh, I think that probably if, if we take nothing else from this webinar, uh, I think education and getting in early is, is, is so important. Um, and I think that I think I saw some research by the Nuffield Trust that showed if you if someone is exposed to good quality, truthful information before they are then shown false information, they are much less likely to believe it. Is, is that your experience, too? Um, it's not that I have anything to confirm that in terms of um, scientific evidence, um, especially when it comes to the social media, what we are seeing on social media is the role of algorithms and the content they promote. The way it's set up at the moment is that they actually make profit out of discussion, out of trying to polarize people so to have these heated discussions because that kind of gives them more clicks and more engagement. 
Um, so possibly we should be looking into that. So the discussion is um, more balanced or less reliant on people being so polarized um, at the moment. Mm. And, and, and again, you know, kind of where are people coming from in terms of why they're believing um, this kind of information? I mean, for, for some people, um, there's heightened levels of fear and anxiety just about the whole uncertainties and situations they're in in society um, that make them much more prone to looking for short, quick answers that they can kind of structure their lives around. Obviously, there's a bigger picture there about how to reduce the anxiety and fears that people are living with in society at the moment. Then for other people, um, they want to uh, a set of, of beliefs that will let them go around doing exactly what they want. Um, uh, you know, we know that during the pandemic, young men were the least likely to be adherent. Um, so for some people, um, it's just going to, to serve them well. Um, now, one needs very, very different approaches um, for that. I think one of the tactics also that's really important, and, and again, it comes down to the whole um, sort of model one has of all of this about infectious diseases, um, is, you know, people saying, well, I don't need this, I'm fine, I, you know, whatever. But you know, what I do affects you. And that whole thing about looking after each other, looking after our communities, looking after our NHS, caring, you know, that side of things, the solidarity, the compassion, the care that was there for a part, for a, for a bit early on in the pandemic, that kind of collective solidarity is so important. Uh, so again, these are bigger cultural and social issues that can really protect against um, the, the, the kind of disinformation we've been talking about. Mm. Well, we've only got time for a couple more questions, but I'll just see what we can squeeze in. So um, Caroline, uh, sorry, Carol Allen asks, can you comment on the original approach to NHS staff for mandatory vaccination? Was there a better way given the helpful analysis about motivations not, get, not to get vaccinated? Yes, well, I think that um, mandation is always a, a last resort and one should try everything first. And actually, I don't think everything had been tried uh, that could have been tried for NHS staff. Um, they, you know, they weren't all given access to trusted people to raise their concerns, to ask questions, to talk it through. Um, they weren't all given uh, paid time off and encouragement from managers to go and get vaccinated. Um, they, they weren't all reassured that if you're ill for a bit afterwards, that's fine, we can cover. Um, you know, so there's a whole lot of different things that could have been done to have made it as easy uh, as possible and also to allay um, concerns. So I think um, I, I didn't support it because I don't think those other things had happened. And, you know, mandation, that what, what happened was very divisive. It was very upsetting. Um, people lost their jobs, the increase of poverty, you know, and people who'd served the NHS or the care system uh, for many, many years, teams got broken up, you know, there was a lot of unnecessary distress. So I think that's where it comes back to, you know, have a model of behaviour in the context, use it, understand the, the communities and the situations, and use that to drive the interventions, rather than come in with um, some heavy handed thing or like saying you know if you don't self-isolate we'll fine you ten thousand pounds when we know that the reasons for people not self-isolating was lack of financial and practical support mm. very true and i and i think probably some of the people have learned that if you hold out the, the policy changes and you, and you and you don't have to go ahead with it so maybe that's another unfortunate consequence of that policy sometimes sometimes not though sadly yeah, yeah. simon any comments on that finally I just want to confirm that um, we saw a lot of negativity around that topic online. And um, I don't think, I think it was actually counterproductive and actually created a lot of negativity, unnecessary negativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we've, we've run out of time and I'm very sorry to people who've asked questions that we haven't been able to get to, but a couple of people asked about um, being able to have a, a link to the BMJ paper that you mentioned, Susan, and, uh, we will send that round after the event to everybody. So we'll, and including the paper of, of yours, Simon, in, uh, in Nature. Um, and also we've had a, 
someone asking if if they can have some more information or examples of social listening tools. So Simon, I don't know if, if we can work with you and we can include some links uh, to send after the event. Thank you very much for that. So thank you very, very much, both of you, for, for a really interesting conversation. Uh, I just wanted to um, let people know, as, as I mentioned at the start, this has been the 99th episode of the COVID webinar series. And on the 31st of March, we have the 100th episode, uh, which is going to be looking at two years on, uh, uh, what have we learnt and what's the future. Uh, we have a very, very distinguished panel of people, including Sir Chris Whitty and Professor Jonathan Van Tam. So it's going to be a li very lively, uh, use useful uh, discussion and tickets are available to buy on the RSM website. And secondly, I'd also just like to mention that tomorrow the RSM also has a, an event on a different topic. This is about assisted dying, um, looking at the practical implications mm -hmm. uh, with an international perspective. And again, that's um, all available on the uh, RSM website. Um, and just one final point to note is that the COVID series has been uh, weekly um, recently, but it's moving to once a month uh, from now on, um, hopefully as the intensity uh, diminishes. So what, thank you very much, everybody, and particular thanks to Simon and Susan for a very interesting discussion today. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.